I'm so excited that you're here. Uh, we're starting this uh, new series called Face to Face. And here's what I know about every one of us. Every one of us were created to worship. The question is not, do you worship? The question is, who or what do you worship? And so in just a moment, Gary's gonna come. And uh, when he comes, I just want you to welcome him. I, he's been here for 20 years serving faithfully. And I believe that God has a word that he has put on both Gary and Maddie's uh, heart. I listened to it on Thursday. I was so excited about it and I can't wait for you to hear it. So uh, we're gonna get into this three-week series. Today we're talking about worship as invitation. Worship as, say it with me, invitation, all right? Uh, how about you welcome Pastor Gary as he comes and speaks? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, a man was woken by his wife. It's Sunday morning. She comes in and wakes him up and says, hey, babe, you need to get up. We got to go to church. And she, he rolls over and says, I'm not going. She's like, honey, <laughs> come on. We're dressed. The kids are dressed. We're waiting on you. So can you please get up? He says, I'm not going. So she's like, okay, give me two good reasons why you're not going to church. So he says, the first one, it's boring. Second reason, nobody likes me. She's like, oh gosh, here we go again. So she goes, honey, <laughs> you gotta get up and go because we're waiting for you. And let me give you two good reasons you need to go to church. One, you've been going to church your whole life and it's a little late for you to stop going now. Second reason is you're the preacher. So I need you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but don't, thanks. Thank you. But it does beg the question like, why? did you come? What is your reason for coming to church today? Like, what's your reason for being here? And then once you get here, what's your reason for doing the things that you do when you get here, especially when you get into this space, when you get into this room? I think a lot of times we can come to church and we don't really think about why we're here. And Adam said a moment ago that you were created to worship, but what does that really mean? So he tasked me, he said, I want you to define what worship is. And I was like, cool, I got that. I'll kick it off. I'll start off the series talking about what worship is. The problem is, as I started to look for definitions of worship, it got a little bit uh, confusing at times because it was kind of like trying to define love. Like, how do you define love? Is love the, the flowers you got on Valentine's Day and a couple weeks ago? Is love taking out the garbage for your spouse? Is love uh, this ooey gooey, passionate, emotional thing, or is it this resolute choice? It's a decision, it's not an emotion. Well, I think there's some truth to all of those definitions of what love is. Those are a lot of expressions of love, but finding one definition of love can be a little bit challenging. And I found the same thing with worship. There's a lot of different definitions of worship, but I didn't find one that I feel like covered everything. So I wanna give you a couple of definitions of worship and then we're gonna talk a little bit further about it. But here's one, worship is love expressed. It's our love expressed. Worship is bowing down and paying homage, which is kind of what you guys physicalized, some of you did this morning, and bowing down and saying, I'm gonna humble myself and recognize you as being greater than me. Worship is the submission of all of our nature to God, the surrender of will to his purpose. Worship is our response to the presence of God. And one last one. Worship is singing really, 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 really loud. <laughs> As a worship pastor here, I'm gonna have to say this is probably the best definition for worship there. Because if it works for spreading Christmas cheer and it's Jesus' birthday, then he probably likes it when we sing really loud and, and worship him. I say that kind of tongue in cheek. I think all of these capture expressions of worship. But here's what we know. Worship is much broader than the 20 minutes of a weekend service. Worship is much bigger than singing songs. And the problem with us defining worship simply as singing is because it gets relegated to this space, this time, this moment, when Jesus and his desire is to have worship be something that transforms your life and you carry with you as a lifestyle. But when we think worship is just singing, then it turns into this kind of thought. And Jesus is not just a weekend thing. He's never been intended to be a weekend thing. It's supposed to be something that impacts 
every aspect of your life. In fact, in Colossians, this is the way Paul described what that kind of lifestyle is. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do what? Everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything. Quick question, is there any aspect of your life that isn't covered under the umbrella of everything you say or do? Kind of summarizes all of it. And the problem is, is when we make worship about the one hour a week that we are here, we neglect 167 hours that we have in the rest of our week. Where your faith and your relationship with Jesus, your adoration that you sing about should infect the way you operate in the boardroom, in the classroom, in your home, in your parenting, in your friendships. So the 167 versus the one hour is way more important that we get worship to be this lifestyle of surrender that you just sang about this morning. So worship, while it transcends music, and I've already said that it's way bigger than music, sometimes I think when it comes to this setting, we diminish the power of music to aid our hearts in becoming faithful followers of Jesus. And we think it's just like, Christian karaoke down at the bar. But it's much more than that. So in the verse right before Paul says, let everything you do in word and deed be done to him as an act of worship, he talks about what this space can look like. This is what the verse before that said. It said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let his word be inside you everywhere that you go. And he says, here's two ways it happens. One is teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. You get here where you hear the word of God, where you can be around people that will admonish and encourage you to become a faithful follower and get his word inside you. And the second way it happens is what? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Paul says, you wanna grow in your faith? You wanna have Christ and his word dwelling in you? Then get around some good teaching where you can be encouraged. But I want you to sing I want you to sing. Those are the two ways you get it in you. And sometimes I think we underestimate the power of singing. So why does God care about you singing? Like that wasn't written as an option. Like teaching and admonishing is a thing you should do and then go do some good works. Teaching and admonishing is a thing you should do and then you should go serve the poor. He says teaching and admonishing and singing as a non-optional thing. And I think he says this because God understands the way he made you. After all, he made your brain. He made your physiology a certain way. I was watching a a study recently about Kathy Lee Gifford who uh, was shot. I don't know if you remember this a while ago. Um, She was in her recovery process. And there was a fascinating video because as she was trying to recover, she had to learn how to walk. She had to learn how to talk. And she had words that she could not say. And she was so frustrated So she was working with this musical therapist who was trying to help her learn how to talk again. And she was trying to say the word light and it would just not, it wouldn't, she could not articulate, she couldn't form the words. But you know what the music therapist did? She said, hey, I know you're frustrated, but just try to sing this with me. So she played the song, this little light of mine. And every time the word, this little light, She could say the word light. She couldn't speak it, but she could sing it because God has wired your brain in such a way that singing helps you receive and understand truth. It music fires up parts of your brains that nothing else can fire up. And so I think that when we do not engage in singing, we are missing out on one of the experiences that God has commanded us to do that he wants to use to uh, let you have experiences like you had this morning. Sometimes I wonder what we're missing out on by not singing. And maybe you're going, well, dude, Gary, (laughs) that's fine for you, but sing is not my thing. Uh, I worship on the inside. (laughs) But that scripture doesn't tell you to let worship be just one of those things that you're doing on the inside. And you may be missing out on this divine download, this breakthrough moment that God wants to bring into your heart by simply opening your mouth and singing and becoming a worshiper. 
You see this all through scripture. Moses told God, or man, he did tell God some things, but God told Moses more accurately. <laughs> God told Moses to write a song and put it on the hearts of his people because he knew his people would need to be reminded of truths that they would only retain through singing. And so they would sing these songs and they would pass them on generation to generation to generation. So what is it that God may want to instill in you to put his word inside you that you might be missing if you don't open your mouth and worship? You had the opportunity this morning to put his word that says, God, you're greater than the mountains. Because I don't know what mountains you're gonna face this week. I don't know what job downsizing you may experience. I don't know what bad news you may be experiencing. I don't know what problems are gonna come up this week, but perhaps, in our corporate gathering, when we gather in this room, God wants to put a word deep inside you so that when you get into those situations later this week, you have drilled a well, a well that can sustain you and carry you. And I can tell you, Matthew and I, we talk and we pray about our church and our experience of worship, but we can't worship for you. And we so desperately want our church to experience exactly what God wants to do in our midst. And sometimes, sometimes I think when I look out here and I'm honest, I'm going to keep it 100% real, and I see people out here sipping coffee and watching this worship thing happen like it's a show, it kind of breaks my heart as a worshiper. Because I think the Father's heart, he wants to move on your behalf. He wants to move in your life. He wants to bring change and transformation. And he can change your life in 30 seconds that changes the trajectory of your life, the next 30 years of your life, if you will engage and allow him to do that through worship. So our singing together is sort of like take-home theology. It really is. I can sit up here and talk for 15, 25, 30 minutes, but if I sing this, don't stop yeah, you'll remember that. You'll be like, I don't know anything Gary said, but we sang Journey in church, and so that was awesome. <laughs> so when you sing these worship songs, these are lyrics that are based on truths of scriptures that can be take-home theology that can sustain and carry you through your life. So hear me, worship is much bigger than music, and you're like, Gary, you're being really judgy. God sees the heart. Yes, he sees the heart, but you know what? The heart should be expressed through worship and through singing for every one of us. So I wanna encourage you, just lovingly nudge you as a pastor who's been here for a little while. If this is something that's not comfortable for you, I wanna encourage you to take a step towards it and go, I'm actually gonna put my coffee down and I'm gonna sing. I don't usually lift my hands, I don't kneel, that's kinda of weird, but I might try the one arm, like, I might try that one time and start to move towards God and expressions of worship. So here's the deal, worship envelops all of life. It's all of our lives. It's a lifestyle thing, but it is to be expressed through singing to stir your affections and shape your hearts toward devotion. So why do we worship? We worship because he wants it. We worship because he wants it, not because he needs it, but because he wants that from you. And not because he needs it, he's all sufficient. He's got angels flying around singing, holy, holy, holy. So your deaf tone voice and my deaf tone voice probably isn't the thing he's really looking for, but he's looking for our hearts to be expressed through him. This is the way it's said in Acts. It says, the God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in temples made by man nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. He doesn't need us, but he wants it. He's not a forgetful God. He's very secure in who he is. Sometimes I think we come to worship and we kind of resentfully sing some songs, like we need to cheer him up, like he's sitting up there like, I wish somebody would sing to me. Like, <laughs> God, you're so awesome. He's like, no, I'm not. No, you are. Remember when you parted the oceans and they walked through it? Yeah. He said, that was awesome. I don't know. And then you, you opened blind eyes and you raised dead people. It was awesome. You think? <laughs> that's not who God is. That, that's not the God we serve. But you know what? 
He knows that as we worship him and give him the worship that he deserves, that he's looking for, it changes our perspective on our lives. It changes our perspective on who we are so that we can experience all that he is. See, in John chapter four, Jesus meets a woman, a Samaritan woman, and they get into this dialogue about worship. And you know what she thought? She thought worship was one of, it's a weekend thing. It's a one hour thing. It's not a 167 hour thing. And this is what Jesus tells her about worship. Because here's what she said. She said, Jesus, you Jews, you tell us we have to worship in this certain ritualistic way. And we have to go to this certain place at the temple. That's where worship happened. And Jesus says in chapter four, verse 23, he says, "Uh, -uh. the hour is coming and now is here when the worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is what? He's seeking such people to worship him. We worship because he wants it. He's seeking it. He's looking for that from you and I. Second Chronicles 16, nine says, the eyes of the Lord roam the earth looking for those whose hearts are toward him. Why? To strengthen them. We worship him because he wants it and he deserves it, but we really worship him because you need it. Because I need it. How many of you need to experience the strength of God in your heart? Well, then you know what he does? He's just looking for those people. Not who will just worship with their lips, but will worship with their hearts, will worship with their lifestyle, because we need it. And so she was able to experience something from Jesus, and, and, and it was called living water that would sustain her that would satisfy her. And so David picked up on this type of soul satisfaction when he says this in uh, Psalm 63, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. That's a verbal expression of worship. Why? Because I've experienced steadfast love. My life was a mess and Jesus came in and he changed it. So my natural response is I will worship you with my lips. Then it says, so I will bless you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. That's a physical expression of worship. Why? Because I've experienced steadfast love. And then it says, my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Ultimately, we worship him because he wants it, he deserves it, but you and I need it. And as we experience his steadfast love, then it satisfies us on a deep level. And you don't have to walk around being thirsty and hungry and looking for satisfaction like I do, like you all do. We try to find satisfaction in our jobs and in people's opinions and our spouses and relationships and our kids' opinions of us and our bank accounts. And then you have the stock market do what it did this last week. And you're like, okay, uh, I'm feeling very discontent and dissatisfied. But when you align your heart with this lifestyle of worship, then you can experience a deep soul satisfaction where you find meaning, you find purpose, you find significance, you find love steadfast love. And so this morning, we get to celebrate somebody who's began living this out. There's a guy named Mike that's going to get baptized in just a moment. And he has decided that he's going to go public because it's not going to be a one hour deal. He wants his relationship to God to affect the 167 hours of his week by living a lifestyle of worship. So let's watch his story. We'll celebrate with him. And then Matthew's going to continue our message. Come as you are. I started going to church as a young child. We'd always try to, you know, sleep in and try to make it look like we couldn't get out of bed so just so we didn't have to go to church. And I think we succeeded because we stopped going to church, you know. Not until I was in my, you know, 20s, you know, I started thinking about it more. And then I actually had gotten a King James Version Bible. And I tried to read it, but it was... It was just too much for me at the time where I stopped reading it and just kind of, you know, went on with life without it. You know, a lot of times when I'd be driving, I don't know how, it, you know, it wasn't like I was purposely trying to turn the Christian radio station on. It was just like, it just somehow it, like my subconscious was just putting it on and I would be driving. There was a lot of truth coming through the radio station, you know, just speaking to me, kind of giving me some of the answers that I've 
you know, was hoping for. There's got to be something more to you know, life than just what's happening right now. Well, a big person that, you know, in my journey was be my brother. He always reached out to me. He tried, you know, much as through the times we weren't really talking that much. You know, he always, you know, he never gave up and gave up on me. So he's, you know, he's been huge in my life. And um, I was talking to him about things, and he was, you know, he goes to the church of Pathways and stuff like that. And he said, you know, I'm going to bring you to my church, and you don't have to be perfect, you know. And, you know, he just, he wants, he loves you no matter what. He, he wants you to, you know, wherever you're at in your, your journey, you know, try to change your life for a couple of years to, you know, to get to where you think you need to be, you know, just come where you're at right now, you know, don't wait, you know, just dive in, you know, yeah, and that's, that's where I'm at, you know, I'm just, I'm all in, it's not always going to be, you know, peaches and cream, but, you know, there's moments where I still struggle, there's moments where, you know, I have a lot of joy, too, you know, I read a lot about fasting and listened to different stuff about fasting and why you fast, so I started to fast on the sixth day. Um, <clears throat> I went into the bathroom at work and I started to pray. I never felt anything like it before in my life. And it was just like, you know, the tears were just rolling down my face. And it was like, like the Holy Spirit was just, was just working in me and it was just releasing all the things that have been pent up inside of me for so long. It was life changing. From that day, you know, no one's going to tell me anything different. You know, I kind of look at baptism as taking a step out, showing everybody else, you know, declaring it to everybody that, you know, you know, this is for real. It's not just something I'm doing for show, you know. I'm serious about being a follower. My name is Mike, and I'm excited to get baptized. It's an awesome privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> and God is doing so many incredible things in our church, and it's so awesome and so exciting to just, to just be a part of it. Um, you know, what baptism reminds me of is this one scripture from David, who's kind of the, the go-to role model for worship in Scripture. In Psalm 27, he says, One thing I ask of the Lord, and this only do I seek. And we can get that up perfect. That I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek Him in His temple. And baptism, it's just another way of saying that same thing. It's like, out of all the things I could want... I want and I'm pursuing and I'm loving and I'm chasing after Jesus because he's changed my life and he's loved me beyond anything I could imagine. Now, this is so true for David because he wrote this when he was actually on the run for his life. You guys probably know the story. He's anointed king and then Saul, he's the current king. He's not too excited about someone being anointed king while he's king. And so he starts chasing after him. He has to leave the country and he finds himself sleeping in caves on the run because he's about to get murdered without enough food, without enough water, with a bunch of stinky dudes who probably haven't showered in two months, all in a little cave together. Not good, not great. And you, it's during this time that David writes this song. It's during that time when he doesn't even have enough food to eat, enough water to drink. He doesn't even have a bed to sleep in. He's on the run for his life. He's separated from his family, from his culture. And that's when he says, the only thing that I want is to be back in the presence of my father, to be in the house of the Lord, to be around people who are loving God and pursuing God. Because David had tasted and he had seen the incredible goodness of his father. He had experienced the love and acceptance that his heavenly father can bring. He's like, I don't care if I don't have anything else. That's the one thing that I want. And see, for him, coming back to the temple was so important because 
back then it was a different way of approaching God. See, God dwelled in the temple in Israel, you know, in, in Jerusalem. And so for David, he was, he was wanting so badly to get back there. And eventually he did. Eventually, you know, Saul dies in battle and David is crowned king and he's able to go back to the temple. And I want you to imagine with me just for a second that David, he, he finally, you know, things have settled down for him. He's not on the run anymore. And he's just carved out a whole day just to hang out in the temple. He's, he's gonna pray, he's gonna, he's gonna read the Torah, he's gonna just listen to the voice of God, he's gonna worship, he's gonna sing psalms. And I want you to imagine that he just finds a quiet corner, kind of his own little spot, and he just kind of settles in and he just starts praying. And then you hear that. <laughs> But you know what, that, that, that's weird. I'm not sure why that happened, but that's kind of like, you know, your chair time in the morning, you got your coffee, you sit down, you read about two lines of a verse and then your phone chimes. You're like, nope, distraction, get behind me. I'm gonna be focused, I'm gonna pay attention. And so he kind of gets back into his zone again and he, he's listening to God and he's praying. Did you get that? Huh. See, the tabernacle and the temple was a very different way of approaching God than how you and I get to approach God. It actually resembled much more like a, a butcher's shop than a church. See, because in order to come to God, if you wanted to just spend some time in God's presence, if you wanted to just, you know, show your thankfulness to God, just spend some time in prayer, you had to go out to your field, you had to examine your animal, you had to make sure that it was looking good, that it didn't have any spots on it, that the eyes were both working, that the hooves weren't cracked, that all the teeth were in place, and you had to bring that over to the temple and bring it to the priest and say, here you go, here's my best offering. And then they would look it over. And if they agreed with you, yeah, this is a, this is a fine animal, this is good, then they would mark it with a stamp and then you would get to go in to God's presence and worship and be with your father while that animal was sacrificed. And all this is because we're waiting for Jesus. We're waiting, waiting for real atonement, right? And this is all pointing forward to that. So that's what all this is about. But when the animal that this person brought as a sacrifice was uh, declared to be acceptable and pure and clean, it was marked with a stamp that said the word kosher on it. You guys probably have heard that word because we talk about it now as kind of a Jewish dietary thing, but it just means clean, lawful, pure. Now, here's the really cool thing. The idea of a seal or a stamp in scripture doesn't stop in the new covenant. When Jesus comes, there's still a seal. Paul actually talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter one. He says, he also, God also, put his seal on us and gave us the spirit in our hearts, down payments. And then again in Ephesians 1, it says, in him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Now, just put yourself in the shoes of a first century Jew whose whole life has been bringing an animal to be sacrificed, and when it gets stamped or sealed, that means it's acceptable worship, it's pure, it's clean. And now Paul is taking that idea and he's saying, you have been stamped because you are in Jesus, because you are in Christ, because the Spirit is inside of you. He's saying, you, person reading this in Ephesus, in Corinth, you are now acceptable worship. You are pleasing to God. You are pure. You are holy. You are righteous because you are in Christ. Because you're in Christ. What does that mean? That means me as a person, I've, I've sinned. I am unrighteous. That makes me unrighteous. That makes me unholy, right? But when I am in Christ, I am now holy even though I've been unholy. When I'm in Christ, the Father examines me like the priest would examine the offering, and in reality, like, I, I haven't been righteous. I haven't been holy. My lips have not always been pure, right? But then, the Father examines me and says, oh, 
you're actually in Christ. So even though you're unrighteous, you are righteous. Even though you're unholy, you are holy. Even though you are a sinner, you are a saint. Because you're in Christ. Because it's not actually about you. It's about what Jesus has done for you and in you. Right? Amen. Yes. It's incredible. So, if you uh, were kind of listening carefully and thinking this through, you might, you might realize, so, Paul, you're saying that we have the stamp on us now, the seal on us, and when a animal gets the stamp on it, they become a sacrifice. So, Paul, our, if we're sticking with this, we become the sacrifice now, right? And Paul would go... Bingo. Let's go to Romans 12. That's exactly what it says. You guys know this one. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a what? As a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. I want to pause and think about the phrase living sacrifice. That's like saying you have a round square. That's like saying you have an alive dead thing. That, that doesn't make any sense, especially for someone who's used to bringing the sacrifice to the temple. You don't see that, that lamb again. You can, you can say bye, right? But the thing is, is Paul says, you are now a living sacrifice. And that's what we just saw in baptism, right? Mike participated in the death and in the, the resurrection of Jesus. Mike is a dead living thing. I am a dead living thing. Everyone in Christ, I'm serious, everyone in Christ has been uh, laid into death with Christ and into resurrection with Christ. It's beautiful. He takes the, our, our, our sin and our unrighteousness and our unholiness and our death and he turns it on its head. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the reality that you and I get to live in, right? So now, even though we're not holy, we know we're holy, and we can keep coming back into God's presence with, as Hebrews says, confidence, because we know that we've been marked with a seal. We have been approved, accepted, called worthy, called enough. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But there's a problem. And I want you to say, what? There's a problem, and the problem is that a living sacrifice keeps crawling off the altar. That's a quote from Dwight Moody, incredible man of faith. If you don't know a story, you should look up some kind of documentary. But the problem with the living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. And Gary touched on this last week when he talked about all of us are prone to wander, prone to leave the God we love. Right? We can get pulled to the left, pulled to the right. And we're, we're looking at God one moment and then, you know, we just get distracted and next thing you know, we're way over here and we're not sure how we got there. Prone to leave the God I love. We crawl off the altar. We're presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, acceptable to God. And then we start looking over here at something else and then we're on the altar and then one foot gets off, and then maybe we're here, and then maybe we're here. And next thing you know, the altar's over there, and we've ended up over here. We're all prone to do exactly that. I've done exactly that. We all do. It's a constant realignment and checking of our hearts, saying, am I centered on the altar? Another way of asking that question is, what's pulling you off of the altar? And here's the thing, if your family pulls you off the altar, there's something fundamentally wrong with how you're relating to your family. If your job and your career pulls you off the altar, there's something wrong with how you're approaching your career. If your fun, your sports, your hobbies, your vacations, your weekends, if anything, anything pulls you off the altar, there is something wrong with how you're approaching that thing. 
because all of those things, if approached correctly, actually keep you centered on the altar and those things actually become worship. Your family becomes worship. Your career becomes worship. Your fun becomes worship. But they can also pull you from worship. But the beautiful thing is that when we realize that we have crawled off the altar, we have a really simple promise. It just says this, it says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. The beautiful thing about our father is he pursues the one sheep who leaves the 99. Or even just hops the fence and is just like right over there, he's like, hey, back over here, come on. Got on the wrong side. He's the one who pursues the son who gets his priorities flipped for a little while, right? Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And James spends the previous seven verses in this chapter going over all these different things that can pull your desires, pull your affections, cause division between you and other Christ followers, cause division between you and God. And then he says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And then he says, don't be double-minded. Because you're actually living, saying, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm desiring to follow Jesus, but you're living with one foot on the altar and one foot off of the altar. He says, you can't do that. Jesus, in his own way, says the same thing. He says, that if a house is divided, it's not gonna what? It's not gonna stand. House divided can't stand. So don't be double-minded. The opposite of that is in Jeremiah 32. It's Jeremiah looking forward to us as followers of Jesus and he's foreseeing the spirit dwelling in us in our redemption. He says, I will give them a single-minded purpose to live in a way that always shows respect for me, in a way that is worshipful, in a way that everything in their life centers on who Jesus is and what he's done for me. So friends, today there is an invitation to live with a singleness of heart. And we're able to because the spirit of God is in us, because we're already righteous, we're already holy, we're already clean, we're already accepted, we're already enough. There's an invitation to live with a singleness of heart of heart. So the question is, what do you, what do we need to realign? 